Welcome to continue Agile Saga with me. Uh, we will be starting today from uh, chapter 54. And uh, at this point we find Egil and Egil's brother, Thorolf, in England. Um, they have gotten there because they were on their on their plundering raids, they uh, ra uh, raids and, and they, they had to had to go to England and it's it's very interesting tells uh, an interesting thing uh, this whole this whole collection of sagas is an interesting complement a uh, fictional complement to the history of England as well not only of, of Scandinavian countries but also England because uh, Vikings went there as well uh, and now we find Egil and Thorolf there in England fighting for King Athelstein. Uh, so I wanted to kind of like uh, put this in a, in a little bit of a historical context. Of course, we have to be careful. Historians have to be very careful about what they believe, what they do not believe. This has to be corroborated with historical uh, research. But uh, it's, it can be complementing, can be supporting data, obviously, for the study of history of the time. Um, this, this saga has been written later on after, after these events already happened, but uh, it was written at a time which was much closer to the events, to the actual events, than uh, what we are now. And, uh, and, and the kings mentioned in the saga, they are real people. Oh, we're uh, real people. Here is a medieval uh, depiction of King Harald of Norway, and he was the he was the king who was first called Tanglehair, and uh, then he won the entire area of Norway and in a battle, um, a sequence of battles, but one really big battle, and then he uh, he uh, after that was called Fairhair, Harald Fairhair. Um, and here is another Harald. He is the current king of Norway. Um, and you can see very well if you just you know take take away all the um, references to uh, modern times. Of course, the, his, his dress is very traditional, but you can see that there's the face that a king uh, during Egil's saga could even have had. So I just uh, decided to include this here. So this is the current king of Norway, Harald V. <laughs> and uh, Harald's son was Eric. He was called Eric Bloodaxe. And uh, the reason for this name for him because he killed a lot of his uh, or a number of his brothers uh, in his own quest of becoming a king after his father died. So here we have a point which uh, is contemporary to Eric's reign, and uh, and you, you can see there in the in the picture you can see see the axe, <laughs> and uh, Eric Rex, uh, which just means Eric King. And <laughs> of course, Hollywood has been very interested in, uh, in modern times about the Vikings and so on. You have to take these uh, always with a, a grain of salt, but I just wanted to kind of like tongue in cheek add this here so that um, take the light off. Um, so that you can see that people continue to be interested in, in the Norwegian kings. So here's Eric Bloodaxe. It's said that Eric secured his importance by gradually killing. Uh, I don't know if he has had 19 brothers. We have to take this, as I said, with a grain of salt. But anyway, his nickname Bloodaxe is not uh, Earth without uh, substance. So, um, 
So he was referred to in Latin texts uh, daily to 1200s as Fratris Interpector Brother Killer. So, all right, as, as we know, Vikings went everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, oh, not everywhere, but uh, to many, many places. And in uh, our readings for today, we find uh, we find Egil and Egil's brother Thorolf in England. And here is um, England is just you know a, for Vikings a relatively short uh, short boat right away. Of course, it's uh, dangerous also, but but it wasn't hugely challenging like you know going going to Iceland or going to Greenland or going to North America. It was uh, relatively close in, 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 the, in these, these terms. So, um, uh, because they went down on the west coast of, uh, of uh, European continent anyway. And so uh, here we have a, a map of England. You see the Kingdom of Scots, is up here, then uh, you've got North Humbria, which is referred to in, um, in Egil's saga, and Kingdom of York uh, is a little bit further south. You've got Wales here, you've got East Anglia here, where London is, is now there, Mercia, Wessex, Sussex, and uh, and Cornwall over there, so you you get an idea of uh, of the the lay of the land at that time, um, because because you know these places are are mentioned. Uh, here is Lindisfarne, and Lindisfarne is mentioned in the in the chronicles, Anglo-Saxon chronicle. Um, as you know, the place where Vikings uh, raided uh, their initial raids. There, they went to a monastery and kind of like pillaged the whole place. But uh, but that was not the only place where they went, um, and and they established themselves so that you know today we have still, as we've said before in this class, we still find in northern parts of England and Scotland we find Viking last names ending in S O N son son and uh, <coughs> fewer of those names here in eastern England. There was the uh, the uh, what is called the Dane law. Uh, the northern from somewhere here to the north north uh, was an area where the Danish laws were adhered to, and that was basically a, a peace treaty between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons said, okay, you can, if you promise to remain there, you can, you can keep your own laws and do whatever you, you please there. So, um, so this is just to um, be kind of like a backdrop for the chapter, <coughs> which um, gives a detailed uh, description of the battle where Thorolf ends up dying, and uh, where where both Egil and Thorolf, the brothers, are fighting for King King Athelstan, uh, the Anglo-Saxon king, uh, the king of England, against the king of Scotland, and uh, he was king of the Viking as well. So uh, what what is interesting here is that it was not it was basically uh, King Athelstan was an Anglo-Saxon and uh, he um, had uh, the Vikings were like these mercenary soldiers today that they they fought uh, in various places where the Viking skills were needed they were good good soldiers good good fighters and. Uh, and uh, they found themselves fighting for King Athelstan against another Viking, um, King Olaf, uh, and who had who had occupied the northern parts of uh, the the island. Okay. Here is uh, the picture of King 
Athelstan. He is said to be a very pious king, and uh, and he promoted learning. He's seen with the with the uh, book or Bible in his in his hand here. And here we go, coming uh, kind of anachronistic, coming to uh, contemporary Hollywood times where uh, we have Athelstan from the Viking series, I believe. Anyway, just to make it a little bit more. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk about the text somewhat. And Oh, I will turn some lights on. Lights back on. So we started uh, starting from chapter 54. Where um, we find um, starting a starting a battle description. And uh, this is on page 84, so this uh, chapter begins. King Athelstan had settled for the night on the fortress mentioned earlier, where he had heard about the battle on the moor. He and his whole army made ready at once and went north along the moor, where they heard clear accounts of the outcome of the battle. So this is the second day of the battle. Uh, it's referred to as the Battle of Wiena, Heath or Wien. The Heath, uh, we don't know where that place is historically, um, but it may have been somewhere in Wales. Uh, it's un unclear. But, uh, but this is the chapter where Thorolf Skallagrimsson Egil Skallagrimsson's brother falls. So Thorolf, Thorolf was the older brother and he dies in this bat battle. And it's, it's very interesting. The previous, uh, previous chapter describes um, Thorolf and Egil fighting, uh, fighting uh, for King Athelstan. They are fighting for an English king against uh, a Scandinavian. <laughs> King from from Scotland, who was ruling Scotland, and what the, what King Olaf and King Athelstan are fighting over is territory. Obviously, it's uh, that's what most of the wars uh, in the history of uh, humankind um, kind of uh, 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 fought for. Uh, we want this territory. We we want the same territory too. Uh, and the territory, the more territory you have, the more power you have. And these kings were always quite hungry for power. They wanted to promote their own own uh, ideas and that territory was important. So they are uh, the King Olaf in the north of the, the Isle, King Athelstan at the, the south, and who's going to get the middle? And that's going to be Northumbria, the Kingdom of York, and so on. So, uh, so we have we have the brothers from uh, Norway, from Iceland, uh, from Iceland, uh, originally from Norway, um, and uh, they were not originally from Norway. Their father was, but but anyway, they've been they've been hopping around Scandinavia and the Baltic uh, states and uh, and the coast of Europe, and now they find themselves there in England. So the first day of the battle had been very successful for King Athelstan. He uh, had done well. Thorolf and Egil were fighting together. They were they were kept together. But for the next day. Um, King Athelstan says, um, I'm going I'm, I'm to split you, you're so good, I'm going to split you. So Egil is taking these troops to this particular place, and Thorolf is, is taking these troops to these columns of, of troops to uh, the, side of the side of the forest there. It was the battlefield, it was designated before that this is where the battle is going to happen. 
this is not these are not battles done via drones or bombings or long range rifles or guns these are face to face battles where people are actually killing each other uh, through the shields with their spears with their uh, with their uh, their um, their uh, other other weapons so it is um, it is kind of very, very gruesome, very bloody, and that's just how wars were done. In a way, a more honest way of fighting the war, where you can actually actually get killed in a very gruesome way, and you are also uh, expected to kill uh, at very close range, not by, not by sending a drone somewhere. Um, sitting in your own comfortable office or uh, launching a missile uh, from a far distance. So, uh, but, but very, very bloody wars. And uh, what happens is King Athelstan wants to separate the brothers and Egil says, I don't want to be separated from Thorolf in battle. But I think we should be assigned where we are needed the most, and the fighting is the heaviest. He just doesn't want to be separated. Now, uh, Thorolf and Egil, uh, by their character, they're, they're two very different, different brothers, and uh, Thorolf is... Uh, more diplomatic, he's like, uh, how can I go and tell the king that we don't want to be separated? He says, uh, on page 88, he says, uh, let the king decide where he wants to assign us. We will support him as he wishes. I can take the place you have been assigned if you want. So, um, so he, he kind of implies that uh, maybe Egil is doesn't like the place where he he was put, and uh, and uh, Egil doesn't like this doesn't like to be separated from his brother. They have been doing this thing for a long time together, and they do it very well together. So uh, Egil says, "You can decide, but this is an arrangement. I will live." To regret. And so it happens. The, the fight, the battle begins, and uh, Thorolf is uh, attacked um, and he is killed. Now, um, Egil notices that, uh, that Thorolf's standard is down. Um, and he, he's, he notices that far from far away, where he's, he, he has his troops. And, uh, and he has he had, had a bad feeling about this, and he knows that now my brother has died, uh, because the standard, the flag, is not up anymore. And after, after everything's over, he goes there, and he finds Thorolf's, uh, Thorolf's uh, body, and... Um, and uh, yet um, they, um, they do very well in that battle, uh, but of course Egil lost his brother. And uh, moving on to uh, chapter 55, uh, where we find Egil in King Athelstan, uh, Athelstan's court or his hall, um, after the battle, which was fought well, a lot of uh, men died, but, um, but the battle was won. And Egil goes there, and first he has to bury his brother, and he does that. So uh, they dug a grave there and buried Thorolf in it with his full weaponry and armor. Egil clasped a gold ring onto each of his arms before he left him. Then they piled rocks over the grave and sprinkled it with earth. Then Egil spoke the verse. 
And this is Egil the poet. He uh, is he's a rough, tough warrior <coughs> who bursts into reciting poetry, uh, poetry which he himself makes, it seems, on the spot. So um, <coughs> we find a lot of poems from, from this on. Egil, uh, Egil recites these poems. He, 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 uh, they, they typically significant situations where he recites a poem. Like here, it's Thorolf's burial. And uh, Egil, uh, Egil uh, spoke a verse. The slayer of the earl, unfearing, ventured bravely forth in the thunder of God's din. Bold hearty Thorolf fell. The ground will grow over. My great brother, near when, deep as my sorrow is, I must keep it to myself. So there's the manly Scandi Scandinavian approach to sorrow. Deep as my sorrow is, I must keep it to myself. Having grown up in Scandinavia, I can vouch that this still seems to be the case in, in many places that the men don't like to express their sorrows, they keep it to themselves. Um, what I want to point out, of course, you know, we have prose. Uh, Egil Saga is, is prose fiction, uh, historical fiction with, with the poetic license that, uh, that we don't know how much, how much this is actually to be trusted, but a, a great deal of the historical uh, characters that appeared there uh, were real. But within this prose fiction, we, we find poetry, another genre, quite often. And, uh, and of course, the Icelanders were the great poets. They, uh, they produced the poetic Edda, which has, uh, has a lot of it's a compilation of, of poems um, of the olden times and, and uh, life in, in Scandinavia. But um, in, in, the, in this <coughs> otherwise uh, prose uh, narratives, we find these poems quite often. And, and you, you, you get introduced to the poetry, Icelandic poetry, in, a, in, in little tiny pieces, so uh, it's not like we're reading an entire book of, the, of those, but what you will notice is that they have a particular kind of style. Of course, this is translated into English, it's not in the original, but, uh, but what the translators try to do is to follow the, the meaning very, very clearly and the, and the style. And the style is such that what we have often in these poems or the cannings of these poetic, metaphoric ways of referring to more ordinary subjects, like here in uh, what uh, Egil said in his. Uh, brother's uh, funeral, he refers to thunder gods din, which is just the battle. Uh, in the next verse, uh, he refers to thunder gods steel, uh, uh, thunder of steel, I'm sorry, thunder of steel is uh, also battle. If you turn to the next page, uh, page you will find uh, a poem that Egil cites for uh, King Athelstan, uh, on, at the bottom of page 90, the god of the armor hangs a jangling snare upon my clutch, the gibbets of hunting birds, the stamping ground of hawks. I raise the ring, the clasp that is worn on the shield's the splitting arm onto my rod of the battle storm in praise of the feeder of ravens. So we have a number of kennings in this short verse. On line one, God of the armor, 
that is warrior or king, referring to King Athelstan, the god of the honor. Uh, line two, a jangling snare, is a more poetic way of saying just ring. Now remember, these were rings that were put around the arms, not necessarily in the, in the fingers, so you get rings on, on the arms. Kings are ring givers, they, these, these were very valuable, and, and it was like a payment or the medal that a warrior got if they, got, if they received a ring. Uh, line three, gibbet of hunting birds, that refers to arm. Gibbet is like up on the gallows where you hang people, that's that horizontal um, wood there, and uh, gibbet of hunting birds where birds might be, might be um, standing, so it's got, got like multiple layers of of, um, of a couple of layers of these, these metaphors. Um, hunting birds, you keep birds on your arm. Uh, so on the gibbet, which is just referring to the arm, but much more poetic. Uh, you have rod of the kettle storm, which refers to a sword. That's kind of apparent or transparent. We can understand that that can, can refer to a sword rod of the battle storm. And feeder of ravens uh, is simply a warrior, in this case referring to King Athelstan. And, uh, and a feeder of ravens, just you know, uh, ravens come and, and eat the corpses of the warriors who have been killed by the feeder of ravens, the, another uh, more, more powerful warrior. Uh, extremely interesting, interesting stuff uh, in these in these um, in these uh, poems. They clearly mark this genre, and they're very colorful and de 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 decorative. And that's the kennings that uh, make them make them decorative. Also hard for us uh, today's reader to understand. And that's why we're thankful for the little notes that have been placed there on the sides of the lines. But, uh, but also, at the same time, very kind of like thought-provoking. And you, know, you just don't refer to arm and battle and so on. You come up with these, these beginnings. We noticed the same style, of course, Beowulf, uh, when we were doing Beowulf. Beowulf is a poem in itself. Um, the entire thing is a poem, and it's got a lot of these uh, these uh, kennings. Uh, one of the famous one ones is the Whale Road, which refers to uh, sea whale road. Whale road, the uh, road that the whales are uh, riding. Okay, uh, back to the Hall Athelstans hall where Egil decides to go after he buries his brother. And uh, people are drinking there. They are, they are kind of making merry after the, uh, after the very hard day of, uh, of a very hard couple of days of, of battle. And, um, and Egil decides to go there, but he's in a really sad and bad mood. He is holding his sorrow to be himself like a, like a Viking would, but he, he is quite affected by that. And then he goes, you can imagine how he feels. He has just lost his, his big brother, just buried his big brother. He goes there and you see these men drinking and, and eating in the warm, nice, comfortable hall. There's King Athelstan. King Athelstan immediately wants Egil to go at the top of the table. Now, the placement on the table is important. Uh, the closer you are to the, to the end of the table where the king is, the more important you are, and Egil gets, gets a very important place. The further away from the king you are, the less important you are. Very hierarchical situation. So there is Egil. And uh, he's just basically moping. He's, he's very grumpy. He's not saying anything. 
Um, and uh, that is because he is very upset um, because he lost his brother and he lost his brother because the king separated him and, and his brother, he believes that that's uh, what may have happened. But uh, anyway, on the other hand, um, there is this belief that, you know, it's your time to call the Valkyries come and, and uh, indicate that you are the one who's going to be who's going to be falling in this battle. And, and that's what happened to Thorolf. In this chapter, we have a wonderful uh, description of Egil. We haven't really had, uh, had a, a nice description of him. We know that he was a he was a big child, precocious child at the age of three in Iceland. He just took a horse and, and rode the horse after his father and his father's party to his grandfather's house when he had been left behind. And he is about seven when he kills a kid. Um, and he's, he's just, uh, he's just very, uh, a strange child, um, and we, yet we haven't gotten a, a good description of him, but here we have on page 90, what did Egil look like? Egil had very distinctive features, with a wide forehead, bushy brows, and a nose that was not long, but extremely broad. His upper jaw was broad and long, and his chin and jaw bones were exceptionally wide. With his thick neck and stout shoulders, he stood out from other men. When he was angry, his face grew harsh and fierce. He was well built and taller than other men, with thick wolf gray hair. Although he had gone bald, at an early age. He had gone bald just like his father, Skallagrim. And uh, Skallagrim meaning bald grim. <laughs> and that tends to go in the family. So um, when he was sitting at this in this particular scene, he wrinkled one eyebrow right down onto his cheek and raised the other up to the roots of his hair. So it's like this, like this. And he had dark eyes and he was swarthy. He refused to drink even when served, but just raised and lowered his eyebrows in terror. So he didn't want to drink. Uh, he uh, was just very upset. And uh, King Athelstan notices that e that Egil is upset, and he gives him gives him uh, this ring. He put his sword through the ring and pulled it towards him. Egil then went back to his place. This is King Athelstan. The king sat down in his high seat. When Egil sat down, he drew the ring onto his arm, and his brow went back to normal. He put down his sword and helmet and took the drinking horn that was served to him and finished it. So uh, in this short uh, couple of paragraphs, we get, a, we get a pretty good idea of what kind of a person uh, Egil was about his character. We, we know him mainly through what he has said. We know him mainly uh, through his deeds. But here we have Egil actually described by the, the author of the, of the, the saga, Egil's saga. So Egil, um, Egil gets this gift, this ring from the king, and that wasn't the only thing that he got from the king, because the king, it's the job of the king to reward his warriors for a well-fought battle. But this ring meant an awful lot to Egil. It was from King Athelstan, and how often does an Icelandic warrior get rings from kings? So um, the, 
the uh, king of Athelstan, he, he continues to give more gifts to Egil. He says, these chests are yours, Egil. And if you go to Iceland, you will present this money to your father, Skalagrim, which I am sending him as compensation for the death of his son, his son, Thorolf, Egil's older brother. Now here we see the Icelandic, uh, English, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Nordic um, notion and el elsewhere as well. But, he, but here we here is an example of this notion of um, compensation, the Ware Guild. We talked about that already um, in in Beowulf. Uh, so you give compensation if. Uh, if someone dies, if if you kill someone, you can get away from it by get away by uh, by uh, giving compensation. Here, uh, here, uh, Thorolf had given his life uh, fighting for King Athelstan, so King King Athelstan uh, is giving compensation to Egil to give to. Uh, Thorolf's father, and that's that's how it goes. It wasn't for Egil. Egil was to take it to Skalagrim on his way back when he goes back to Iceland. Egil accepted the money and thanked the king for his gift and friendship. From then on, he began began to cheer up and spoke the, the verse again. So he says, "Okay, I'm I'm in a good mood, better mood now." Uh, it's it, it's interesting that. Um, the, how much these gifts from the king meant, but I if you think about modern day people, if you get a raise, it means a lot. Uh, you kind of tend to think very positively about a person who gives you a raise um, in salary. Uh, so it's it's not that that different. Um, so. We will see what happens with the chests of silver that King Athelstan gives to Egil uh, when we get towards the, the end of our readings today. Um, because Egil went back to, Nor back to Iceland, but he did not give the chest to his, his father's column. Okay, so Egil uh, keeps uh, reciting these poems, and um, and uh, here we have like a heroic poem. It's referred to as a drapa. It's on page ninety-one. Egil composed a drapa in praise of the king, which includes the following verse: the waver of battle, who towers over the land, the royal progeny has fell three kings, the realm passes to the king of Ella, probably the king of Northumbria. Athelstan did other feats, the highborn king subdues all this I swear, dispenser of golden wave fire. Golden wave fire, wave fire is just gold, golden gold. Sounds very uh, poetic, and um, so this type of a type of a laudatory poem is referred to as the drapa in in this tradition. So um, moving on, uh, Egil stays there in England for the winter, and then comes spring again, and all the Vikings become. We've talked about this, they become kind of restless. They have to start sailing again. And um, and he wants to leave England, asks for uh, the, uh, the uh, permission from uh, King uh, Athelstan. And, um, and he wants to go and see how Thorolf's wife, now widow, is doing, and he has to pass the information, the this 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 news piece of news that Thorolf had fallen in the battle. 
So Egil announced to the king that he intended to leave for Norway that summer and find out about the situation of Asgard, who was uh, my brother Thorolf's wife. All right, and um, Asker was um, was uh, Thorolf's wife who had been born in in Iceland to Björn and uh, Thora, which is you know this is going to be coming up uh, again later in later chapters. So. He uh, is given permission by Athelstan, King Athelstan, so that he can he can go. Uh, but he uh, promises to come back. He goes to Norway. He sails back to Norway, um, up north, and goes to Thorir's um, place. Thorir uh, had died, and his son Arinbjorn had succeeded his titles, he was the Hersir now, this powerful person. And um, Asker and Arin Björn um, live in the same place because they are kin to each other actually. Um, and uh, that is uh, where Egil goes. So, uh, in the next chapter, we find Egil saying, reciting different kinds of poems. He goes to reciting love poems. We would think that this is such a tough, uh, obstinate warrior that he doesn't have a softer side inside, but yes, he does. And uh, he goes and he tells Oscar that Thorolf is dead and Oscar um, was upset. So page 92. Oscar was very upset at the news, but she answered Egil fittingly and played the matter down. So it is not only the Scandinavian men who keep their feelings to themselves or the people at that time, uh, whether it's region or is it time related, um, he kept his uh, his feelings. He kept played the matter down. Okay, my husband is dead, but I'm going to play down the matter. But he was very upset, and um, so this is Oscar. He had been married to Thorolf, and uh, Thorolf had actually brought Oscar as a as a young girl. Um, from Iceland to uh, to Norway because Asgard's uh, father was Björn and uh, Björn and Thorolf were buddies back there in Iceland. Uh, Thorolf was the one who was following Björn everywhere. So uh, what we find next is Egil falling in love with his brother's uh, widow Asgard and uh, he starts reciting these love poems on page 93. The goddess of the arm where hawks perch. Woman must suffer my rudeness. When young, I would easily dare to lift the sheer cliffs of my brow, my eyebrows. Now I must conceal in my cloak the outcrop between my brows. The outcrop between my brows is my nose. Would you hear that? This flat, big, big nose. When she enters the poet's mind, headdress of the rock giant's earth. A lot of cannings again. And uh, and Arin Bjorn is who is Egil's Egil's uh, friend, has been Egil's friend, uh, is older a little bit than uh, than Egil, but they have been buddies for a long time. So Arnim Bjorn is like, what's going on? How come you are, you're saying these kinds of poems now? What is going on? And Egil uh, says another poem, uh, poem 24. 
Um, I seldom hide the name of my female relative in the drink of the giant's kin in poetry. Sorrow wanes in Seafire's fortress. Some who stir the din of Valkyrie's armor have poetic fingers that feel the essence of the war god's wine. Of course, Odin is the war god and his wine is poetry. So he starts writing these love poems or reciting these love poems, not, not writing but, but reciting them. And he says, it's your king, kinswoman, Asgard, and I would like your support in arranging this marriage. So he confesses to Arendurn that he wants to marry, marry uh, Asgard. Asgard and Arendurn, they are uh, cousins, okay? And that happens. Uh, so, uh, so uh, people uh, agree that uh, because Arendir agrees that uh, the marriage is fine, and then Bjorn, who is Asgard's father, needs to be asked as well, and his, he gives his permission. Um, it doesn't say anywhere that Asgard's. Uh, permission was asked, but it seems that uh, she was also favorable toward this this uh, marriage of hers to Egil. So what we end up having is a wedding for Egil and Oscar, and uh, they will continue their adventures together. So uh, another complicating action, you know, we could we, we could stop the, the saga here, but uh, it would be less interesting because what happens is uh, it, we introduce to another person uh, who is tied into this this whole thing uh, it is Bjorn's son-in-law, Bjorn's son-in-law. Uh, whose name is Barry Ond of Benberg. Barry Ond, uh, whatever, uh, whatever uh, language you want to use as the basis for uh, its pronunciation. I don't pronounce uh, Icelandic uh, names very accurately. Probably. So we are introduced to, to Berg uh, Onund, and he is Björn's son-in-law because he has married Björn's daughter, Gunhild. But Oscar is also Björn's daughter. And this is the complicating action here. So we have daughter number two from the second marriage with Alf and uh, Björn after Thora, Björn's first wife, died. So, Thora was Asgard's mom, Björn was his father, and uh, after Thora died, then uh, Björn married Alf. And then they had Gunhild. Okay. And Gunhild had married this powerful person, Berg Ond. Now, Oscar has married Egil. And uh, so, just to recap, Oscar is Berg's daughter by Thora, the first wife, and Gunhild is Björn's daughter by the second wife of after Thora died. So Gunhild and Asgard are half sisters, right? They have the same father but different mothers. Alright? And uh, now <laughs> what happens is Bjorn ends up dying. Egil 
Egil is Bjorn's son-in-law, but so is Berg Ormond. So we have two son-in-laws who are married to these half-sisters. And this is a bad situation because Berg Ormond uh, just thinks that he's going to inherit everything from Bjorn. Um, Note that it's the husbands who inherit, not the wives, but the husbands inherit because of who they are married to. Berg owned uh, inherits Bjorn's uh, possessions, uh, farms, houses, because uh, Gunhild is uh, his wife. Now, obviously, this is the same kind of a problem that uh, we've, we've seen before. Egil uh, is upset about this, and, and rightly so, because how come he didn't get the, the half of, the, of Bjorn's uh, possessions? Uh, why did it all go to Gunhild's husband and not, nothing for Asgard's husband, Egil? So he goes to Barry on and, and, and confronts him and says, uh, could how come you're keeping this all? And because Oscar is also Bjorn's daughter. My wife is also Bjorn's daughter. And, uh, and uh, Barry, it, it doesn't go well. Barry on is like, uh, I'm not giving anything to you. Uh, you. You are really kind of like really obnoxious to come here and say that that because Egil says that your wife is not of of such high uh, social class, of such high birth as as Asker. and very honored is just like, what are you saying? You have nerve to come and say that because it wasn't very diplomatic on the part of Egil, by the way. But Egil is no diplomat, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and uh, Berg Onund says Asgard is basically a bastard because, remember we talked about this before, because Thora was stolen by Björn and taken from his, uh, her father uh, without the fathers and the brothers who was another uh, person here, Thorir. Um, an important person. Thorir uh, was uh, Thorir the Herser, uh, the important man. So, um, so Bjorn had taken uh, Thora um, against his father's will without going through the proper asking for the woman's hand. He just wanted the girl and, uh, and uh, took him and they went to various places. Ended up in Iceland where Skaladrin was upset when he found out that, oh, you weren't properly initially properly married because you didn't have the permission of, the, of uh, Thor's relatives. And, uh, and this is coming back to kind of like cause trouble for now for Egil and Asgard because Berg Onund says that Asgard is not as legitimate a daughter. She doesn't, doesn't deserve the inheritance because her mother was a slave woman, as he, as he refers to Thora. Even though Thora is the high-born person initially, but because she was taken against the uh, father's, uh, the, the family's uh, permission. So it's, it's complicated, but, um, <coughs> but um, you know, we would kind of think that, you know, oh, come on, it's not Asgard's fault that, uh, that Bjorn was so much in love with my mother that he just took her, and uh, of course it's, it's not, but, but these things have consequences for the next generations here. 
So, uh, so they have a fight. Uh, uh, not a, not a fist fight, but, uh, but uh, a huge disagreement. And Egil says, "Okay, I'm going to take this to to the court." And the and the court in that time it was this assembly, the uh, Gula assembly, where uh, they. People are from all the parts of Norway are meeting in this one place, and the king comes there. And what is a complicating action, a complicating thing here, in addition to all the other complications, is that Barry Bond is one of the king's men. And now we have the second generation of kings. We have King Harald. Started the saga with King Harald and, and the trouble that King Harald caused to uh, Kveldulf and Skalagrim, who were Egil's father and grandfather. And now we have the second generation uh, of kings. We have King Eric, Eric the Blood Axe, and uh, King Eric is. Uh, Buddies with Berg Onund. Uh, Berg Onund uh, works, so to say, for the king. And uh, another complicated thing here is that King Eric is married to a Gunhild. Now, this is a different Gunhild, but um, same name. Uh, and this Gunhild is, um, is a nasty woman. Uh, here in So is King Eric a nasty man, uh, according to the, the saga. And of course, you know, it's an interpretation uh, by the author. So, uh, so King Eric and Gunhild are very much against Egil uh, because Egil uh, has this history, his, his father's pilgrim, and, and so on, were already uh, in. in, in in not in good terms, uh, which is a mild way of saying saying it. Uh, they had to leave Norway because of King Harald and go to Iceland, and that's where Egil was born. Egil comes back and he gets into in, into trouble with King Eric uh, through getting into trouble also with Bert uh, Onund, who is the king's. So they go to the assembly. Where everybody goes to get their legal issues straightened out, and uh, so it's like you know the court. It's uh, originally referred to as a thing, and um, and that's that means assembly in Scandinavia. So they go there, and Egil brings up this uh, this uh, complaint against Berg on and uh, and. Uh, and they discuss it. Berg on uh, brings his side of the of the story, and um, and uh, the king is there, and the king doesn't side with really with either one. But it's kind of obvious that Egil is in the in the losing side of that, and uh, he has to flee. And he does, and he flees. Of course, how do you flee? Uh, you go to your go to your boat, and and you uh, sail away. And um, they uh, Arin Bjorn, who is Egil's friend, but is a is a diplomatic person, also you know works for King Eric uh, on the side. And uh, so he's kind of like a middleman here, and he's trying to kind of negotiate things. And he, he goes and tells Egil, you need to leave. Uh, and, and Egil leaves, but he, he's, he's not the one to, to uh, forget uh, when someone has done him wrong. And what he finds is, um, is um, actually, interestingly, we go back to King Eric and Brunhild, and they have 
a son who is about 10 or 11 years old and he is, it, it's, it's interesting, he's the king's son and he is uh, called his wrong world. He's a kid, 10 or 11 years, and he owns a boat, he owns a war boat, and he has men to come with him, and, and, uh, and he, is, he's, he's, he, takes his, he takes his boat, and he wants to go to his foster father's, uh, Frodi's place, uh, into, you know, the boat right away. And so Prince Ronwald, this is on page 103, Prince Ronwald had a small warship with six oars on either side and painted above the plumb line. He always had the 10 or 12 men on board who followed him everywhere. And when Frodi Frodi is one of, one of the King uh, Eric's like hitmen, uh, who's taking care of the place uh, where uh, the king cannot, cannot be. So uh, when Frodi left, Frodi had left Ronald, uh kind of along with his men, not without adults, but anyway. So Ronald took the boat and 12 of them rode out to Herdla. Herdla, uh, a, a, a place, an island kind of a place or a, a place next to, next to the sea. The king owned a large farm there, run by a man called Beard Thorir, and Romwell had been fostered there when he was younger, and Thorir welcomed, welcomed the prince and provided plenty of drink, plenty of drink, and the kid is this age. So, uh, interesting, interesting world. And what happens is, uh, Egil is sailing there, he is, um, he uh, is being followed because Egil had really upset now also the king, and uh, the king uh, is being told by his wife Gunhild that you have to get Egil killed, or at least uh, you know uh, he, he was uh, he was pronounced an outlaw, so that anyone can basically kill him. But Egil is not easily killable. And, and uh, so uh, he goes with his, uh, his uh, ship and his men and they go uh, to, they, they land there to the place where, um, so we have Therion and Hud, his brother, and Frodi, the king's hitman, and they are uh, drinking somewhere after this assembly and um, in, a, in a different kind of a party. Uh, Romwell went to a different party. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so Berg Onund is there with, with his brother and his buddy Frodi, and they're drinking, and Egil ends up uh, killing them. Uh, one against three, but uh, that's what Egil can do because it's also cunning. He uh, went there uh, to uh, to the place where where they were they were drinking and uh, kind of like you know cheated uh, them by saying uh, you, that there were men sitting and they said there's been there's been you know a bear and we're watching we're watching our, our sheep and uh, to protect the sheep from the bear that is somewhere around here. So Egil is like, okay, I'm going to use this. And, and he uh, says, look, the, there's the bear. And the little boys, they go and tell uh, their own and his, his buddies that uh, the bear, they, they've seen the bear. And their and the other two, they go and look for the, for the bear. The bear is Egil in the bushes, <laughs> is moving there to kind of like, you know, cheat them, very on, and Berg on and comes there, Egil kills them, kills him. Uh, the other two come, he kills them too, so he ends up killing these, these uh, three men. And of course, Berg on is uh, king's, 
things not so bad thing. Uh, but it gets worse. So Ekel goes back to his ship and then uh, they uh, they uh, end up seeing little Ronwald with his men in his warship uh, and uh, and uh, they uh, Egil says kill them all ends up killing killing the kid as well. So and the kid is the king's and the queen's son. So um, so trouble is waiting and uh, clearly the only way to get out of this trouble is uh, to go back to Iceland and that's what Egil does so he, he goes there. He uh, comes there and what we hear is Skaladrim, his father, is quite old now and, uh, and uh, yet uh, what, what happens is Skaladrim is like, okay, so you're back, so how about that uh, chest of silver that King Athelstan, Athelstan gave to you in order for you to give to me, um, you know, this, this word gets around here. And Egil is just like, oh, hmm, uh, you don't need any, you don't need any silver, don't you have s silver of your own? And uh, like, you know, two chests or what have you, two chests uh, or a chest full of uh, silver of your own, so you don't need you don't need that silver. <laughs> and, and then Egil goes to a party with Asgard, uh, and so they leave Skalagrim there in the in the farm. And Skalagrim is peeved by this whole thing uh, that Egil is not giving him the King Athelstan's. Uh, Silver, the payment for uh, Skalagrim's son Thorolf, who had given his life for in the, in the fight for King Athelstan. So, um, what Skalagrim does is um, in the, in the night, everybody else is sleeping, all the uh, all the uh, servants and so on. And Oscar, uh, Oscar and, and Egil are at this party at a different farm, celebrating the arrival of what have you. They haven't seen in, each other in a while. And uh, Skalagrim, uh, all he is, he goes and um, takes his horse, and he takes take, he takes his silver chest, and uh, and goes and rides into the forest. Uh, and buries his silver chest there because he was so annoyed by Egil's attitude. And so we can kind of see that Egil and his father, they, they, they had this kind of contentious relationship between each other. And, um, and so Egil, uh, I mean, Skalagrim uh, hides his treasure, so that Egil is not going to get it when Skalagrim dies. And Skalagrim dies that very night when uh, he comes back from, from riding his horse to hide his treasure. Uh, and uh, nobody knows where that treasure is, but there are these rumors that it may be somewhere there or here. When Egil and Oscar come back, uh, they they actually they actually the, the servants find uh, Skalagrim dead, sitting on his bed, and he's already stiff. And uh, Egil is they send a message to Egil. Egil. Egil comes home immediately, and buries his father. Okay, that's uh, today's adventures.